Okay, so uh, we're pretty much on schedule. Uh, what's coming up now is I'm going to give you uh, basically a double ignite speech. Think of two matches going at once because I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, try and frame uh, badges for you, uh, talk about what they are in a relatively high level, give you some quick examples. As you're listening to me, I'd like you to think, what are the strengths of what I'm hearing? What are the weaknesses? What might be the opportunities? And what are the, some of the threats uh, that we should think about? And you have post-its on the table there. I'd like you to be marking those down because after I finish speaking, I'd like you to go over there and put those up there. We did this back in 2017. And uh, it was a very useful exercise. One of the things we want to be able to do is compare what people say today with what they were saying in 2017. So this is your first bit of interactivity. So. Oh, OK, so let me uh, just come out of that. So, without further ado, uh, people talk about a skills gap. Is there one? This is uh, U.S. information. The interesting part of this is this was a white paper written for associations, industry and professional associations, telling them that there's a market opportunity for recognition of learning that's not currently being met. Uh, and this is the stuff that uh, David Porter, in a sense, was writing about recently when he was talking about Ryan Craig and that last mile training and what's missing from education approaches today. Basically, um, World Economic Forum says that technical skills are popping up and popping down and moving quickly. What's really important is that ability to move, to pivot, to be able to move from one situation to the next situation. Those are typically thought of as soft skills. Um, so what we're trying to build here is a T-shaped student. This is a familiar slide to many of you, this notion that you, the vertical is the domain and the uh, horizontal is the transversal or cross-cutting skills. But really, is it a T or is it a T, 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 T? Because you keep on having to learn those, those domain-specific uh, skills. So what you're looking for is the, the skills that will keep you agile, the skills that will keep you nimble, those human skills, the cooperation, the collaboration, the resilience, the continuous learning skills as opposed to uh, attributes. These things can be learned. So um, um, Corporation for a Skilled Workforce basically says we have a, a, a disconnect now. We want college programs that are aligned to jobs. We want to be able to hire new talent. And um, we want career pathways that are clear and credentials that actually tell us something. What we have is program outcomes that have lots of gaps, don't have the final polish to them. We have employers who can't come up with a decent job description, can't, can't talk about what competencies they're looking for as opposed to somebody they want to hire and push out the door because they didn't work out after 60 days. So, and what we have is a situation, we have an education system that was originally really designed for the top left of this framework here, the idea of the emerging workers, the serial students who work their way through from K to 12 all the way into the workforce via post-secondary. But now we have transitional workers. People have to move from one sector to another. We have people who are working, need to skill up while they're working. And then we have the gig economy down on the bottom left there. The, the entrepreneurs, the people that move from one project to another, have to pick up skills during a project. So. This notion of education up, where you define the, you define what you're looking for, you develop the system, that's very waterfall. And often, by the time you're delivering, it may not be as relevant. What's happening now is this notion of employer down. This is the competition that uh, was being talked about by Ryan Craig and that he's actually investing in. 
is these kinds of solutions. These last mile training providers who will take graduates and move them into the system, either through boot camps, through uh, intermediary staffing models, income share agreements, etc. So, and what they're doing with these uh, intelligent, knowledgeable students is they're putting that last element of polish onto them. The, the, the skills they might need because they're working with SAP or some other kind of software as a service platform that they need for their first job, uh, but also the soft skills training. So that's why a lot of you institutions are already working on uh, work integrated learning programs. It's that project based applying your learning, solving problems, not just spouting knowledge. So uh, my rant about paper, this is an old one, basically it's not very transparent. Um, there's QA in there somewhere, but nobody really knows what it is. It's often buried. Uh, it's easy to forge. Um, it's, it's, you can't clip it like a coupon and say, I do, I'm going to use this part of the credential here. It's just this one monolithic um, um, uh, opaque window. It's hard to align. And difficult to share, easy to lose. So, open badges were designed to uh, fill a niche. Uh, the notion is that it's a portable record of learning. So Mark has talked about the standards, the importance of standards and starting simple. So it's, um, it's a graphic. It's got uh, what's called JSON-LD, uh, structured information built into it that can be referenced back to who issued the badge, what was it issued for, when was it issued, what's the story of the badge, how, what do people have to do to earn that badge, will it expire, is there evidence, etc. All in a structured format. It's a digital representation. And it's, the idea is you can earn it here and then leverage it over here. Um, it enables things like flexible learning pathways. It actually shows you your progress. We talk a lot about gamification. I've got a slide about that later, so I won't go on about that. There's a, a fun little thing about it, which is that you're showing, when you show your badge, for example, on LinkedIn, you're showing what you know, but you're also showing who recognized that in you. So for institutions that are looking to increase their footprint, the, uh, your learners become your brand advocates. And that's an online trust system. I like to say that trust is not binary. It's built up over time in small pieces. People say trust, what is it, walks in the door and then gallops out, out the other door. It, it gets built up over time. Um, it can support pathways. Here's a pathway that uh, some of you are already following in this room. That's the empowered educator. You earn six of those badges around the periphery and you earn the milestone badge based on the criteria that uh, eCampus Ontario have set up. I like to say it was invented by hippies back in 2011, and in 2017 uh, got a haircut, bought a suit when, when it joined IMS Global. So here's just an example of a badge. I earned a badge from City and Guilds by engaging with the document and reflecting on that document. This is my reflection um, from the hosted badge. That's my uh, badge on uh, LinkedIn right now. When, when you click on C certificate, it loops back and um, you can see that hosted badge and see who gave it to me and why it was given to me. Now, we have someone here today who's gonna talk to us about how open badges can work better with LinkedIn than they did, um, than they're doing right now and they, they did before. So hopefully we'll have some insights coming from that. Um, just to map badges and badge space uh, right at the moment, they are digital credentials. They could be micro-credentials. They don't have to be micro-credentials. They can be thought of as alternative credentials, and I'm grateful to David Porter for coming up with that very simple pivot on the, on the terminology that made everybody relax and think they don't have to be hard credentials. They're signals. They're signals of capacity. Um, um, there doesn't, and what I, what I like to say is gamification is not the place to start. You should start with recognition based on our experience in the past. Um, gamification, game mechanics can, can be very useful. I've already spoken about some of the aspects of that, but if you start 
With gamification, it's hard to move out of gamification. So some ways to um, um, recognize uh, with open badges, uh, some examples here from real life. Uh, World Vision is doing it to simply to badge courses. What's interesting there is they're saying you take our course and you bring evidence you've taken these other three or four courses from other providers and we'll give you our fundamentals badge. So that's a, that's a nice aspect to it. Often used for competency certification, so a number of examples of this. What's different about a certification from a certificate is it's typically, it's time delimited. It will typically run out and it's based on competencies rather than evidence that you achieve certain outcomes in a course. It's saying you can do this, you can be trusted to, to do this at this level. And so it's often used for compliance, so health and safety training, for example. Um, also used for membership. So there's an example of this with the, what is it, Learning and Performance Institute in the UK. This is actually a paid membership. It's a professional designation. So it's got some meaning to it. It doesn't have to be quite so formal. Uh, it can, there are other forms of mem membership. Um, it's a way of uh, recognizing um, either experience. So uh, an example I was giving, um, I work with Doctors Without Borders, and we were saying if you had a badge that said 2010 Haiti, you wouldn't have to say too much more. You know, people would, would have an idea what that meant. Um, and my, my father was in World War II. He had service medals serving in the North Atlantic. Similar idea. Um, and then values, interests, and goals. Um, I was a co-writer uh, and an early signatory of the Bologna Open Recognition Declaration uh, that we ran at the uh, EPIC 2016 in Bologna. And so this is me saying, I believe in these things, I support these values, and, and uh, I'm looking for other people who are interested in those things. So a bit like, a, what is it, a B corporation, that idea of a B corporation. We support these values. So uh, just for post-secondary people, this is uh, Penn State has this quite useful um, taxonomy, basically saying it can be curricular, can be credit-based. Uh, it's, it's often cross-curricular, co-curricular. They talk about open curricular and that, what they mean by that is MOOCs. And what's really interesting is down on the bottom right there, there's a big focus on faculty development, faculty engagement, and that's something that eCampus Ontario has really picked up on. Um, so I like to say badges can be thought of as just these little things, but to me they're lenses on learning. They're a way of talking about what was the learning experience, what was the story of that learning experience, um, what, um, how long did you have to spend doing it, what kind of effort did you have to put into it, or did you just show up? Was there assessment, and how rigorous was that assessment? How much can I trust it? And is it uh, the recognition, was it just a, a, a step in the pathway? Uh, is it something just internal with the institution? Or are there ways in which that badge can be recognized in a new place beyond the technology? Because a huge part of this is the social aspect. Will it be recognized in this new uh, community that you're going to show it to? So how portable is it? Um, and, and then what I, one of the things I like to call badges is it's like learning impact anal analytics. So in other words, IBM, because people were using this example, design thinking very important to a services company. They flag it, they say that's important, and now they're, they're counting the number of people who are earning this badge and where those people are and building skills heat maps as a result. So all of these things add up, in my mind, to quality, which again is not a binary concept. To me, quality is usefulness for purpose. So some quick examples. Um, Stellar, um, so Cité Collégiale has been working in the Stellar community. They have a really interesting approach to co-curricular activities, extracurricular activities. They map them to um, industry, uh, university tenets or graduate learning outcomes, institutional learning outcomes. And they talk about exposure versus integration versus transformation, which for them is the really big uh, example of that. So a really interesting uh, follow-up, and they're working with uh, Melissa Pete, I believe, and just ways of people telling the story of their learning as, as it's happening using these things. Um, 
uh, Education Design Lab started with this 21st Century Skills Badging Challenge, working with particular um, institutions in particular regions with employers, um, have now taken it um, to what they're calling tee up the skills, that metaphor again, um, basically taking these uh, soft skills badges, and they have a real sort of set up recipe for working with organizations around this. It's a little, you have to sort of sign up for it and follow the rules, but it's a really interesting process, and it's, and it's one worth looking at, if only as a model. And just uh, talking about how important these skills are in particular roles uh, on a scale of one to four, and then you come up with these mixes. Corporation for a Skilled Workforce has a different um, approach with their connecting credentials, which I, I found very interesting in a recent conference as well. Um, if you were uh, working in continuing education, here's a, a model of using this for an ex extension program uh, for gardening, basically um, lessons leading up to in, into uh, quests leading up into a mastery badge. Um, they're being used in vo for vocational purposes. People can uh, uh, basically sign up for these badges to be assessed against the badge. So you're basically buying the assessment and then you're providing evidence that you have achieved um, the mastery of being a pastry chef, for example, and that this basically gets added to your portfolio. Um, this is a, a more uh, complete example of that uh, um, Learning and Performance Institute. So they're doing uh, membership uh, community recognition, accreditation of uh, organizations, certifications of individuals, and also awards down on the bottom left there. They're doing the whole thing from soup to nuts. Um, we were talking about the private sector getting involved. I talk about IBM a lot. I thought I'd talk a little bit more about another Fortune, uh, Fortune 100 company, what was formerly called Ernst & Young. They're all over this as well, typically for the vertical skills right now. Uh, there are some business ones involved, so in other words, leadership uh, and the, the business and sales aspects of it as well. Um, and Mark was talking about Connie Yao, uh, was, uh, who set up LRNG. They're now actually working hand in glove. They've merged with Southern New Hampshire University to develop pathways for uh, employment, pathways for uh, post-secondary credit, working with uh, communities that are typically underserved and developing uh, a number of different approaches along those lines. So this is just meant to give you some ideas. If there are any questions, unfortunately, we don't have time. I hope I didn't go over. Ah, I'm not doing too badly. So I've got a minute left. So what I encourage you to do now is try and think through what I've said and uh, poke holes in it. Give me some idea. Give us some ideas. Um, um, warn us of some uh, some curves in the road that we we might want to avoid. And uh, we're going to take. I believe uh, 20, uh, what is it, 10 minutes to do the SWAT, and then we have a break at 10:15. Uh, if I if I'm correct, good. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>